from the heart of rural France. This is the Keto Woman podcast, brought to you by me. Hello, Keto lovelies. I'm Daisy Brackenhall, and I've spent most of my life struggling with my weight and confidence, and I've always had a difficult relationship with food. Even when I finally got to my target weight, after weight loss surgery and eating low carb, I couldn't maintain it and I was miserable. I've been keto now for over two years and it has given me the freedom to fall in love with food again without the constant gain, loss, guilt, virtue cycle of before. Health and happiness is where it's at now, running on fat. Welcome to the Keto Woman podcast. Each week I'll be chatting to inspirational women maybe even the odd man, to discover the secrets to their success so that I can share them with you. So what is keto? Keto is a way of eating that enables you to switch your body's main fuel source from sugar to fat. Who doesn't want to be a fat burner, right? But how do we achieve this? A great place to start is by keeping carbs under 20 grams a day. So things like leafy greens and above ground vegetables, plus some nuts and seeds and the incidental carbs you find in things like full fat dairy. Choose delicious fatty proteins and be free and easy with oily dressings on salad and butter on your veggies. Once you're in the swing of things, you can tweak it to suit you. Make your own personalized keto. You'll hear all sorts of ways to keto from my guests. There is no one way to do keto, no one size fits all. I hope to show you just how flexible and fabulous this way of eating can be. I'm not a doctor and most of my guests won't be either, so we really can't give you medical advice. It's always best to consult your own doctor when making big changes to your diet and lifestyle because they know you and your medical history and so have access to the bigger picture. Wouldn't it be helpful to have one place where you could find all the links? Want to sign up to my new Patreon exclusive Facebook group, Daisy's Lovelies? No problem. How about subscribing to my YouTube channel? Please help me notch up my first thousand subscribers by going to links.ketowomanpodcast.com and following the YouTube link. Not following me on Instagram yet? Hit the Instagram button. You get the idea. All the buttons, all the links you need are at links.ketowomanpodcast.com. Welcome to episode number 141, where I am joined by extraordinary woman, Leslin Keith. Leslin has a clinical doctorate in occupational therapy with an emphasis on lymphedema and obesity. She has started four lymphedema therapy programs in California, including two in private practice. In addition to treating lymphedema and other lymphatic disorders, she currently researches, consults and lectures on lymphedema, lipedema and obesity nationally. She is Director of Research and Board President for the Lipedema Project and an instructor for Close Training and Consulting, an organisation that trains therapists to treat lymphatic and fat disorders. What a fascinating conversation I had with Leslin. I really hope you enjoy it as much as I did. I'm starting to get a little less finickety about audio setup, especially when it makes life easier for the guest. But sometimes that means the audio is a little less perfect than I would like it to be. I'm working on letting go, I promise. Today, we are also joined by the wild roosters that live near Leslin. Atmospheric. Welcome, Leslin, to the Keto Women podcast. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you so much for having me, Daisy. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's wonderful to meet you. I had a friend who lived in Hawaii for quite a while, so I'm used to that being at the start and end of the day. It's the evening for me, morning for you. Yes, 12 hours difference, but it's, it's working out fine. <laughs> it is. It definitely works out fine. I'm not, I'm not really a morning person, so this is definitely uh-huh. the best way around for me. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Well, perhaps you could kick off just by telling the listeners a bit about you. Sure. Uh, um, Leslie Keith, I'm an occupational therapist. And the last 20 years, I've focused on the treatment of lymphatic and fat disorders, mostly lymphedema. And I could talk a little bit about what that is. But um, this is what I've really specialized in treating. And I've had a private practice. I've worked in outpatient settings. But 
pretty much just working with people who have lymphedema and other uh, lymphatic and fat disorders um, for the last 20 years. I wanted to, to talk a little bit about also why keto, why did I bring keto into this practice? And it was an interesting trajectory on, on what happened because my whole focus was I want to help these people have lymphedema. So they have chronic swelling for whatever reason, usually because of cancer treatment. So they had lymph nodes removed, they had radiation therapy, and now the fluid that goes into an area of the body can't get out, and so they swell. And then a few very rare condition is a hereditary condition where they're born with their lymphatic system not properly formed, and so they end up with very swollen parts of their body because of that. And so this was my entire focus. I just wanted to help these people. And there is a standard treatment that we do that is very, very effective usually. But it seemed like as time went on, more and more of my patients were obese. They had lymphedema, but they also had obesity. And it made it very difficult to help them. And not only that, we would get their swelling down, but their weight wouldn't change. They would come back, they would weigh even more, and the swelling would be worse. And so these are the people that were the revolving door in my practice. Mm -hmm. They were coming back repeatedly for treatments because the swelling was, again, out of control. So I started looking at what can I do for these patients? I was getting pretty despondent and frustrated because I felt like I wasn't doing anything for those patients. And at that time, I think the Atkins diet was having a little bit of a resurgence. Um, this was around uh, 2011. I had read Wheat Belly with Dr. William Davis and uh, started looking at uh, Why We Get Fat by Gary Tobbs and started thinking, well, this is something I can do for myself. But, oh, wait a minute. This helps people lose weight wouldn't that have an impact on their lymphedema? And, and again, in the literature, people who had lymphedema and were overweight, if they lost a very small amount of weight, it seemed to have a favorable impact on their lymphedema. So the theory was it was the obesity itself that was causing uh, the lymphedema, that uh, the pressure on the lymphatics, the inability to remove the fluid effectively enough, that's what was happening. So we just got to get them to lose weight and then we'll be fine. At about that time, I was experimenting with myself, experimenting with my patients, but then about that time I went to a lymphedema conference and there was a gentleman that was passing out a draft of a nutrition book that he wanted to publish for people who had lymphatic and fat disorders. And I started reading this book, the draft, and it was recommending that you have a plant-based, low-fat, high-carb diet. Matter of fact, recommending 80% of your calories coming from carbohydrates. Wow. <laughs> and from what I was just learning about, you know, a ketogenic diet um, was just the opposite. And I was horrified. So I started thinking, well, I need to counteract this somehow. What can I do? And started exploring what to do. As a matter of fact, we, we gave our own little mini conference in uh, our little town in California. And we had what we found out later were the titans of, of keto research and clinicians. We had Eric Westman, Steve Finney, Jay Wortman, Jeff Bullock. And uh, a patient um, who came, uh, Lynn Daniel Ivey, was a patient of Dr. Eric Westman's. And they came to our little town and they talked all about how to do a ketogenic diet. Wow. Stellar team. <laughs> yes, it was spectacular. We did that in 2014 and really energized the small group of us in a small town in California. And I thought, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go get my doctorate so that I can be associated with the university and I can do a full research study about with people who have lymphedema and obesity and they use a ketogenic diet. And then I can show that, of course, this is the better way to eat. I was assuming that that's how my results would come out because it was coming out that way with any other condition when you use a ketogenic diet. So a little bit of bias going into my research. <laughs> so I, I did do that. I decided to get a doctorate in occupational therapy because I was able to do the whole thing online. Fantastic. I could keep working with my patients, keep doing my practice. 
And so I um, sent out 75 letters to past patients that I had had that all had a BMI of over 40 and had uh, lymphedema and said, would you like to be in this study? And through that, I was able to enroll 12 people. I developed a lifestyle program, 12 group sessions, six individual sessions, and we focused on making lifestyle changes, specifically encouraging a ketogenic diet. So of the 12 sessions, seven of them talked just about the diet because I figured that was going to be the hardest thing to change. Um, then we also did exercise and sleep and stress management and various other things like that, but really focused on the ketogenic diet. And now, so this is how crazy I was. I went into that group thinking, well, I'm going to just tell them about this and the science behind it. And of course, they're going to want to do it. <laughs> I just thought everybody would do the diet. So it didn't quite turn out that way. But 60% of them, six out of 10, because I had two that dropped out, six out of 10 did the diet, four did not. And as I found out later, that's pretty typical. I mean, it's not something that it's easy to do uh, to, uh, according to Margaret Mead, you know, it's hard to change a man's diet than it is to change his religion. So it was a hard thing. But I think because they all knew they were in a study, I think they actually worked harder because they, they were all afraid of ruining my study. <laughs> but as it turned out, because I had six people who did it and four that didn't, it actually showed the, the stark differences very, very well. Yeah, perfect. So I had 10 outcome measures and, you know, waist measure, weight, BMI, uh, limb volume, you know, how big their limb was at the beginning and the end of the study, uh, various quality of life measures and 10 outcome measures. And in all 10, it was definitely significantly better outcomes for those that chose to adopt the ketogenic diet. So that was pretty spectacular. And I was able to write an article, get that published. I went to the um, National Institute of Health conference that they had on lymphatics and presented my poster. And so I really got the information out about it and thought, okay, now I'll write a book to counteract that other awful book. <laughs> I'll write a book that, that says that this is actually the better way to eat. But interestingly, as I'm continuing on with this, and many of my patients are using this way of eating, whether or not they have weight to lose, it's still having an impact on their lymphedema. It's still making their swelling go down. And so I started thinking, okay, it's not just that we have this tremendous amount of weight and it's putting pressure on the lymphatics. There's something else about this way of eating that is good for our lymphatic system. And so that was, is more of what I'm on the focus now. Although, you know, 75% of my patients have obesity. So I definitely need to help them lose weight. But this diet is not just about helping them lose weight. It's about making their lymphatic systems heal and making them more healthy, more functional. It, it's been fascinating. And so I, I now have even more theories about why keto is good for lymphatic and fat disorders with or without obesity. Um, but it's just been a fascinating ride. I mean, I, I love doing this work. I love talking to people about it. I love, uh, I have patients from around the world that will email me. And so I correspond with them and just try to give them as many ideas as I can for them to talk to their physician, their medical provider who knows their full situation and see if, if this is something that they can do, because I really believe that this is the key to dealing with lymphatic and fat disorders. Perhaps you could explain a little bit about what the lymphatic system is and why it's so important. Sure. I mean, yes. I know a bit about it. I've always thought about my mother always used to feel my neck if, if she thought I was coming down with something to feel the glands there, which presumably are lymph nodes. Right. So it must be some kind of indication that there's some inflammation going on, that there's something going up with the immune system. Yes. Yeah. So your lymphatic system is a one-way system of removing fluid and other constituents from your tissues and getting it back to the blood circulation. So it's this, a series of very delicate tubes, vessels, that are throughout the body going from very small capillaries all the way up to larger vessels. And 
pretty much in the periphery of your body, that fluid that it carries is clear. And so it's not very visible. And this is uh, one reason why it has been so poorly studied and, and not, um, not so recognized as integral to human health for, for a long time because you, you just didn't really see it and you didn't really think about it unless you got cancer. Right, yeah. Because we knew that it was involved with cancer metastasis. Somehow it went into the lymph nodes. And so, so oncology and, and those specialists knew more about the lymphatics, but the rest of the people, I mean, they thought one of the functions of the lymphatic system is to help return fluid from the periphery and bring it back into the blood. But we always thought that the lymphatic system was kind of a backup system. So uh, mostly fluid was reabsorbed into the veins after your arteries deposited everything in the tissues, oxygenated, gave it nutrients, and then it just went back into the veins. But only about 10% that didn't go into the veins, that was picked up by the lymphatics. Well, there was incredible research that was done, and uh, I think it was published in 2010, that showed that no, very little and only very limited circumstances does anything at all go back into the veins. Everything else is 100% evacuated by the lymphatic system. This is huge. I mean, our lymphatic system is so important. To, that's one of its functions is fluid balance. If your lymphatic system is not working, we cannot get all of the fluid back into the blood circulatory system. It is very, very important to that, um, that one function there. And then um, another function is immune functions. And that's what you're talking about when your mom felt your mm -hmm. neck because those, those are the lymph nodes that it's as the, the um, fluid is carried from the vessels to the nodes, and we have them throughout our body, about 600 of them throughout our body. It is getting filtered out. It's chopping things into tinier bits, killing the bad stuff, and then sending it on. So when that fluid eventually gets into the blood, it's been cleaned up. Hopefully, most of the stuff has been killed. Those lymph nodes also store lymphocytes and other things that are going to the, the major constituents that kill bacteria and foreign matter and stuff like that. So your lymphatic system is huge for immune functions. And then um, another important function of the lymphatic system is actually dietary fat mobilization. It takes dietary fat from your intestine and brings it up to um, the blood circulation. Interestingly, though, only long chain and short chain fatty acids are mobilized through the lymphatic system. Median chain fatty acids go straight to the liver via the, the portal vein because this is a really fast energy, important thing um, for if you are, for instance, in the ICU, sometimes I will give you MCTs because boom, it gets to your liver and it really helps you with healing in those emergency situations. Mm. So that doesn't need to go through the lymphatic system, but the lymphatic system is going to move all those other fatty acids and take them from your intestines and put them into the blood. Um, and that is actually why one of the first parts of the lymphatic system was discovered because it makes the, what's normally clear fluid, it makes it milky white. And so now um, you've just had a meal and if you were to be opened up, you would see these milky white, they thought they were veins or, you know, just another one of those humors, one of those other fluids, but they didn't realize that it was this uh, important lymphatic fluid. So you could see that, whereas you couldn't see it anywhere else in the body with the naked eye. And interestingly, and this is also something that's, that's new uh, in the lymphatic field, is that the lymphatic system is also important for reverse cholesterol transport. So your arteries are bringing cholesterol. As we know, this is important to life. We have to have cholesterol for every cell in our body needs it. So your arteries are bringing cholesterol to the tissues and feeding the tissues. And now specifically HDL cholesterol is removed from the tissues and brought back to the blood circulatory system to be delivered back to the liver via the lymphatics. Oh, interesting. Specifically, the lymphatics it picks up the HDL. So um, you can see how the lymphatic system is huge to human health. And so this is now the focus of what I am researching and learning about is what can we do to make our lymphatic system the healthiest we can 
because we're finding out it is so important to, it's integral to health and disease, the lymphatic system is there. We're finding it's involved in diabetes and, and of course in obesity and heart disease in uh, neurodegenerative diseases, it's, it's the lymphatic system is there. And so now to be the healthiest we can be, we want our lymphatics to be healthy. So what powers the lymphatic system? Well, <laughs> I have my own theory there too. And uh, one of the reasons why I feel like a ketogenic diet or a low carb, high fat diet is best for the lymphatic system is what I am, my theory now is, is that fat fuels the lymphatics. And I'm seeing um, several bits of research that the way I interpret it, it's not so much how it's been interpreted by the authors, but how they interpret the data. I'm seeing that, that fat fuels lymphatics. And I'm looking at some older studies that, um, for instance, there was one in 1987, Mura and Associates, I think it's out of Japan. It was an animal study. And they were looking at how fast the lymph vessels contracted because some of the larger vessels have an ability to contract and pump the fluid along. And when they fed a standard rat chow, standard mice chow to them, they had a certain speed. And then when they put olive oil in there, which was an interesting choice, but when they added olive oil, um, that all of a sudden the contraction speed, the transport ability of the vessels increased. Mm, interesting. Oh, mm -hmm. that's, that's interesting. And then um, I saw another study. And this was a human study. It was a single case study. And they were looking at what to do for someone who had harmed abdominal lymphatics. And traditionally, what we've done is that we just, um, we try to avoid long and short chain fatty acids, because then they, they the abdominal lymphatics won't be burdened with having to move them. And so they did a series of different diets with this person. And one of them was an MCT only diet, no other fats. And it was fed intravenously with a, a J tube or something like that. He had only MCT fats. And so remember I said that MCTs don't go into lymphatics. Well, when they then tested what, what was in the lymphatic system after he was given this diet, now there was MCTs in the lymphatic system where normally they would not ever be. And so my interpretation of that is the lymphatic system needs fats. And if you're not going to give it any other kind, it's going to take the one that it doesn't normally get because it needs fat. And then um, there were several other studies, um, again, mostly on animals, but one that was, again, I think on mice, and they did uh, four different diets, and then they looked at how many vessels there were for transporting fluid out of the tissues. So standard diet, here's the vessels we have. Now let's give a, an agent that blocks fatty acid oxidation. What happens? Oh, we're seeing vessels disappear. Wow. We're not getting any fat. And so the vessels disappear. Um, so there was a lot fewer vessels, as you can imagine, a lot of reduced ability to take fluid out of the tissues. And then they were given acetoacetate, a ketone, huge proliferation of vessels. Now we're being able to empty more fluid from the tissue. And now this is really interesting. They gave then the animals the agent that blocked fatty acid oxidation and the ketone supplement. And they had then the normal number of vessels. So even though they, they didn't, they weren't able to oxidize any fatty acids from their diet, they had this ketone supplement that allowed them to build vessels. I mean, that seems, it's, it's only on an animal and I hope we could do it on humans, but that seems pretty obvious to me that, that the lymphatic system needs fat. Another thing that tells us that, that really this way of eating is the best for the lymphatic system. That's so interesting. It reminds me of the problems you can run into with the gallbladder if you're eating for a long period of time, a low fat diet. Right. When you were talking about it, it just reminded me of that, that whole, just the whole system gets sluggish. It sounds like, you know, similar from that perspective just not going to function properly if you don't give it fat. Yeah. So presumably if you're somebody who 
eats an extremely low fat diet, it's going to have an impact on your lymphatic system. Yeah, on, on your whole, you know, everything. Every, you know, we humans were evolved to to eat fat. That's how we got our big brains. Um, so, you know, this in the last hundred years, where we've associated a plant based, low fat diet with virtue and supposedly with health is is really harming us, really harming us. And I, I saw it very much amplified in the lymphatic disorder community because I think that the, the lymphatic system is very much reliant on fat. But not only that, there are foods that are highly inflammatory that through, again, my own interpretation of the data that is presented on various research studies I'm seeing that those inflammatory foods are having a negative impact on lymphatics. And um, I know that there's a lot of research about um, highly processed seed oils that are highly inflammatory. I haven't seen anything with that with lymphatics and lymphatic disorders yet. Um, but I have a feeling that if I was to test that, that would be the case. But specifically, the, the um, studies I've seen with high fructose corn syrup, or just a, a high carbohydrate diet in general have demonstrated how they inflame the lymphatics. There was uh, one study, I think it was in 2012, they uh, wanted to look at the impact of metabolic syndrome on lymphedema and what it impact it had on the lymphatic system. And so in order to give the, the rats metabolic syndrome, they fed them a high fructose diet. So I, I think that was exemplary right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, that you should have been able to take that to the next thing. Well, obviously, this would give you metabolic syndrome. But so they did that. What they did is they imaged the inside of the lymphatic vessels. And the high fructose diet fed animals had a highly inflamed inside of the lymphatic vessels. So that they had as much as a 50% reduction in transport capacity. Wow. But now, wait a minute, on humans, another study, they weren't even looking at this, but it's something that, that seemed obvious to me. This group led by Katie Schmitz and others, they were looking at, it just published in, uh, in JAMA, um, Journal of American Medical Association, last year, 2019. It was a wiser study. And she wanted to look at the effect of diet and exercise on lymphedema on breast cancer survivors. These were all women who had had breast cancer and they had lymphedema in their arm because of their cancer treatment. And so they had four groups. All four groups had what we call a compression sleeve. So it's just a compression garment you put on your arm to contain the swelling. Mm -hmm. So the control group, only a sleeve. Then they had one, an exercise group. They were doing some weightlifting and some um, cardiovascular. And then they had one, a diet group, and one that was diet and exercise. And look at what happened with each of those groups. What was the diet? Well, they gave them uh, Nutrisystem. The Nutrisystem shake, which one of the biggest components of that is fructose. Oh, no. <laughs> and then they supplemented that shake with fruits and vegetables. So for the first time ever, this has never happened in a lymphedema and weight loss study. For a turn, first time ever, the amount of weight loss was not correlated in any way with the reduction in their swelling. In every other weight loss study, no matter what diet they used, typically it would be a low calorie, low fat diet. They'd lose weight, their lymphedema would go down. This one, it didn't. Mm. And I think it was because they have this high fructose diet. Their lymphatic vessels were swollen. So even though they lost weight, they had this reduced capacity to transport fluid out of their swollen arm. But the researchers in their conclusion, they said, we can't figure out why this happens. Because, I mean, you're, you're coming from that paradigm of, well, of course, this plant-based, you know, low-fat diet is going to be the healthiest. And so that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And why didn't it work? And it, it didn't. Well, it's also that assumption, as you were talking about when we started, that the obesity itself was a problem. Yeah. And I think that that does is a contributory factor. 
I think that, that there is, um, there was several, again, animal studies, but it showed that the conclusions that came in these two independent studies were that obesity could exacerbate lymphedema, but not a high fat diet. So a lot of people were thinking you eat a lot of fat, of course you get fat and you're going to make your lymphedema worse. But they showed that animals that were fed a high fat diet and were obese did not have a worsening swelling, but the ones that had just obesity had worse swelling. So I do think that the obesity is a contributing factor, but it's not as strong as a factor as what you're eating. I think that has is the most important thing. And when I um, talk to my patients about what we're going to do to manage your swelling, you know, we're going to do the specialized massage. We're going to do compression therapy. I want you to do these certain um, decongestive exercises to help pump the fluid out. But by far the biggest thing you're going to do to help yourself to manage this chronic condition long term is to change how you're eating. And my feeling is it's going to be low carb, high fat. Mm. I was going to ask you, actually, when you mentioned the the different groups, and one of them you mentioned was the compression and exercise, how did they fare? Because it helps, doesn't it? If you build muscle strength and you exercise, isn't that part of what helps the lymphatic system? Absolutely, yes. Um, Because your lymphatic system doesn't have a heart to pump it Mm. along. Although the larger vessels have a contraction ability to help pump it along, but to um, definitely my patients who are more active, less sedentary, they are going to fare better because they are helping the lymphatics to move the fluid out to pump along with muscle contraction. And the same thing, interestingly, with deep breathing. Oh, really? Um, that, that deep breathing, uh, those lymphangions, that part of the lymph vessel that has that contraction ability, they respond not only to pressure changes from either outside pressure from like a massage or muscle contraction, but they also respond to lung volume. Hmm. I'll tell you, for 18 years of my practice, I always thought that the deep breathing had an impact only on the trunk, that it would help those vessels that were nearby that could respond to the the lung volume. But we have a new uh, imaging technique called IC Green. You can uh, inject this fluorescent material into lymphatics. We had a healthy volunteer injected lymphatics into her arm, and we could see those lymphangions pumping along and how fast was the fluid moving because we could, you know, just look at it right there with this fluorescent material. And then we had her do some deep breathing and those vessels in her arm started pumping faster. Wow. How interesting. When we talk about this overall program for our patients, not just diet, we're talking about, you know, what are you going to do that makes you breathe deeply? Maybe you are so disabled, you can't go out and do cardiovascular exercise. Well, you can still do yoga or just sitting there in your chair and breathing deeply it has an impact on how your vessels are going to function and how they're going to pump. So uh, deep breathing and, as you say, muscle contraction. And it might be, again, you're sitting in your chair and you're just pumping your ankles. You're just opening and closing your fists. You know, so those are the type of things I do with my patients, particularly the ones that are obese. As you probably know, Daisy, you're not going to exercise to lose weight. You're going to start exercising when you've lost weight, when you feel better, when you feel like you have more energy, when you have less pain. And so I actually bring in more extensive exercise way later, you know, where we have all those symptoms have been reduced and you feel like moving. So then I would say, okay, now you're going to start walking or or you're going to, you know, get in the pool or whatever it is that that, that works for you. You'll start doing those activities to really facilitate the lymphatics further. Yeah, because it's it's so easy and it's so commonly said, isn't it? You just got to eat less and move more. And it's uh, when you're morbidly obese, it's like, no, I don't want to. Thank you. Yeah. (laughs) yeah. Moving, you know, you're sitting there telling me this as a non-obese person. And I can tell you as a morbidly obese person, it is not fun to exercise. It is far from fun. It can be painful. Yes. 
you know I used to just from working had quite a physical job and I used to just come home I used to be in tears in the evening just with welts on every bit of me that rubbed and and, you know and it's just horrible so (laughs) to to tell someone who is that kind of size to get up and move more right nope (laughs) right and I think you've uh, had with your other interviews with with women with lipedema Mm. which is a fat disorder that can be very very painful and not only are the, the lower body very very large and heavy but then you also have this great deal of pain and now they've been guilt tripped their whole life by if you would just move more if you would just eat less you wouldn't have this problem. Mm. And so now they feel guilty and they feel like it's all their fault. And when they try to comply, it hurts too much. So no, I don't want to do that. So uh, that is never something that I would suggest in the beginning. Now, you know, people are not always open to changing their diet. So this is something that I discussed on the initial evaluations. Are you interested in trying something else? I know you've tried many things. Are you interested in trying something else to help with your weight? I would help you with that. But it has to be your choice. It has to be something that you want to do. And I've had several patients that, I mean, this is someone that's chronically coming back for more and more treatment. So I'm seeing them over an extended period of time. So I had one patient that it took two years of me saying, you know, there's something that we could try, you know, short term. We'll just see how it works. Two years I was talking to him before he finally decided that, yeah, let's do it. You know, after another hospitalization, after nearly dying, okay, let's do it. But at first, I mean, he's, when I'm telling him, eat a lot of fat, <laughs> um, you know, are you sure you're not trying to kill me? I mean, this doesn't sound <laughs> yeah. right. You know, it is very scary. Mm. And this was actually in, in the beginning when I first found out about low carb, high fat, I was really saying, yeah, yeah, eat a lot of fat. But now I've come to believe, well, let's just cut the carbs. Let's keep that the primary thing. Make sure you get enough protein. We need that for healing. We need that for strong bones. But let's just fill in with fat. Mm. Don't shoot for a particular number with, you know, how many grams of fat you want to get that per day. But let's use your body stores as the fat part of your diet. And this was a lot easier for people to handle because a lot of people, there's a lot of fear of eating fat. And people told me that just looking at on their plate would make them nauseous. You know, they, you really have to work into, you know, eating fat, particularly animal fats, even though I think those are the healthiest, much more healthier than plant fats. But we have to work where people are at and start where they're at. And maybe it's going to be, well, let's just take wheat out of your diet. Let's just start with that. You know, wherever they're at and what little thing we can do. I mean, I've I've seen a profound effect on just with going gluten free Mm. on the lymphatics. Seems to be highly inflammatory to the lymphatics as well as many parts of our, our body system. So start where they're at and don't add exercise until you're way into it and you feel better. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. You've really got to assess on an individual basis, like you say, where they're at and what they're prepared to change, what they're prepared to change, you know, now, next week, next month. Mm -hmm. Because you know, of course, that with these little incremental steps, they're going to start feeling better and better as they go. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be more likely to make more changes. But maybe, you know, straight out the gate, it's just a bit too much. Right. It really depends, doesn't it? Some people like to really go all in, but You've got to assess that. Yeah, I've had some patients tell me that, you know, I know I I have an addictive personality. I can't just cut down to two cigarettes a day. I have to just totally cut them out. Mm. So I want to just do this full bore. And so, okay, that's where they're at. That's what we'll do. And I've had, you know, some people that, you know, we're we're having constant contact. I'm helping them along. They need a lot of handholding, which is fine for me because... I can talk about it all day, but other people, I've had other people, uh, colleagues who know nothing about the diet, give their patient my handout. The patient takes it away and runs with it and does fabulous. No assist for me at all. So, wow, that's great. I mean, there are people like at that end of the spectrum too. So as you said, Daisy, just wherever on that spectrum that person is, You know, obesity and changing your diet and a lymphatic condition are all chronic. You might need help frequently and for a and for years. 
we have to be able to stick with people for years and have plenty of other resources for them. In, in my community, before the pandemic, we had a, uh, a dining out group so that once a month you can come with and meet with other like-minded people and, you know, eat a nice meal at a restaurant and talk about various issues and get support. Feel like you're not so different and mm. so isolated from everyone else because you're eating differently from the rest of your family or the rest of your friends. So, you know, we have to have those kinds of, of supports in place for many people in order for them to change. Absolutely. It really makes a difference, doesn't it? So it's the lymphatic system is really wrapped up with the immune system. It's key in that. Mm -hmm. So would I be right in thinking that there's a connection with autoimmune disorders? Yes. Or not? Am I making a leap there? No, no. I, I, I think that there um, there's a lot coming out that I'm, you know, looking into that stuff right now of, of really the role of lymphatics in health and disease. And there's been several on lymphatics and diabetes, on cardiovascular, and I've seen some inkling of autoimmune, so I'm going to look in for further into that. So again, healthy lymphatics means a healthy body. Mm. And we're seeing that also when we, we look at a healthy diet, healthy body too, and what is really a healthy diet, what's a proper human diet. And when we change to, for instance, when you uh, change to more of an animal source keto, what impact does that have on the various conditions you have? And, and we're seeing, and this is anecdotally, right? A bunch of people trying things out on themselves, but lots of reports on, on those changes. So uh, I think, yes, autoimmune, I would say that there is uh, a connection there. This is really interesting too. Another thing that led me to believe that, that fat fuels lymphatics is that in our body, where uh, we have lymph node beds, this concentration of the immune function, that area of the lymph nodes, it's always lying in a fat pad. Hmm. So for instance, when you have breast cancer and you're going to have some lymph nodes taken out, they color it with a dye so they can find those lymph nodes they need. And you know why they have a hard time finding them? Because they have to dig through the fat pad in your armpit to find those lymph nodes and take out the ones that they fear might have cancer in them. And so um, you ask the doctor, the surgeon says, okay, I removed four nodes. Well, how many do I have to start with? Well, I don't know. I couldn't see them all. Mm -hmm. They're in that fat pad. And so uh, some researchers in Australia had a theory that that lymphatics, again, because I think they're fueled on fat, when there is an immune emergency, they have an agent that can cause um, lipolysis, cause fat to burn, to break down, so that now we have energy provided to the lymphatic system to help it fight this acute emergency. But if we have a chronic situation, for instance, chronic swelling in a limb and it's inflamed, then the body is saying, whoa, we have a chronic situation. We better increase our fat stores to be able to supply the immune system with what it needs to power it, to fight that. And so there is another agent in the lymphatic system that causes lipogenesis. And so this is what happens with uh, many people who have chronic long-standing lymphedema. Their limb gets very large but only a small component of it is fluid. The rest is fat. Mm. And so they can be not obese anywhere in their body, but then they have this large limb. And then if you were to do imaging of it, it's a very small amount of fluid in there. It's a lot of fat because the body said, we need energy to fight this chronic situation that's happening here in this limb. So just everything points to fat fuels lymphatics. You know, eat healthy fats and keep your lymphatics healthy. It's so interesting to me, yes, that it comes back to that and that animal fats in particular are the better way to go. But what I also think is, is so interesting that our body has this fantastic alternative fuel 
if there isn't enough food around, you know, this and no people fast now intentionally, but going back when it wasn't necessarily something <laughs> that people were doing intentionally, they just didn't have any food around. Right, right. And so the ketones get produced, which is this fantastic alternative fuel source that the body seems to love and it seems to really help repair sometimes as well that it just yes. all seems to it just fits so well when you start talking about keto as a way of eating it just yes. clicks doesn't it? it makes so much sense yes and for my own um, self I mean, i've been eating this way for 10 years and over the last year i've been experiencing with carnivore and uh, the main reason was because in our lipedema group so the women that have a fat disorder, but there's also a fluid component to it. Um, many were doing very, very well on keto, but more of a plant on the plant source keto spectrum, because I mean, women tend to be vegetarian. So they go to keto, but okay, if I'm going to have macadamia nuts and I'm going to have, you know, things that are plant sources mostly, and they would get a plateau and they would still have inflammation. They would still have, you know, stuff going on. They felt like, okay, this worked to a point, but now it seems like every other diet that it's not continuing. And so many of the women were experimenting with carnivore. And I thought, well, how can I recommend this? How can I talk about this if I don't try it myself? So I uh, did start that last July and have been eating that way ever since. And for myself, I mean, I, I didn't really have any issues going into it, but I do feel like I have less bloating and you know less gas, that kind of stuff. I was lucky enough to have a bioimpedance device that I was testing out in my clinic. So this looks at your body fat, lean mass, and water. Mm -hmm. It was like this $14,000 device that I had for 30 days. And so I'm doing it on myself, I do it on my patients. You know, I want to know how much water they have in them, how much what's going on inside their body. And so I did that on myself before I started carnivore. And then a month later, after I uh, had been doing carnivore for a month. And even for myself, where I didn't feel like there was much going on. Um, I did have an increase in muscle mass. I had a decrease in fluid and a decrease in body fat. And my weight had gone down about five pounds. So I feel like even though I felt like I was doing good keto beforehand. I was doing lots of blueberries and other plant-based stuff. And when I took those out, the profile all looked better and I felt good. So I figured, well, why shouldn't I just continue eating this way? So I have been doing that for the last year. And now whenever ever someone is saying, I've hit a, a stall, I've hit a stopping point with keto, I said, well, you might want to just try this for a month and it may not be something that you do the rest of your life, but maybe a couple times a year you do all animal source foods for a certain period of time. It might be something that, you know, you might want to add to your repertoire. And so many women with lipedema are doing that. I'm now working on a couple of my patients who want to do that with it for their lymphedema as well. Yes. I can remember talking to Amber O'Hearn about this actually. And and how you could potentially use it a bit like people use fasting right. to have alternate days or, you know, a couple of days a week that you eat carnivore to sort of rotate it in like that if you don't necessarily want to do it for large blocks of time. I thought it was an interesting idea. Yeah. And I do think that um, doing it for at least a month um, is going to work better than just going, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm carnivore and the other days have some plants. I feel like it, it takes longer for those plant toxins to get out of your body. Mm -hmm. And so you might realize more of a difference if you have more consecutive days, but experiment, see what you like, see what works for you. I do believe that as humans, we have certain needs that we all have. And so we all are going to benefit from being restricting carbohydrates and having plenty of good fats and having enough protein. But then our immune response, our lymphatic system, can be different depending on how we respond to especially plant toxins. You may be able to tolerate having a handful of nuts every day, but I may have a huge allergic reaction, get a lot of inflammation, a lot of swelling because of those nuts. 
So that's where we have to experiment. So in general, restricting carbs, eating protein and eating fat is going to be good. But now we got to get the specifics. And that's going to be to your preferences and what your tolerances are. Yes, and I think that's very useful to do a carnivore diet for, say, like you say, 30 days, especially if you're suspicious of maybe there's something you're eating that you have a feeling you're not reacting too well. Mm -hmm. You know, never mind the sort of weight loss stalls, but maybe sometimes, uh, you know, you have a bit of gastric distress or you just don't feel particularly good. Well, it's a great way, isn't it, to do carnivore for a block of time and then test things. So an elimination diet, basically. Right. And actually find out what the culprits are. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that's a perfect thing. It is. It's hard to know when you're, you know, there's a lot of foods that are keto, you know, that you can eat on a ketogenic diet. Mm. And so it's hard to figure out, was it the Brussels sprouts? Was it the shrimp? You know, what was the problem when you're eating such a variety? And I do think that when people are new to this way of eating, they automatically want to think, Oh, I feel sick because I ate all that fat yesterday. They want to go straight to that. Must be the fat is the problem. It had nothing to do with all that uh, spinach and, and Brussels sprouts and broccoli that you had. I'm sure that was nothing to do with it because we are conditioned to believe that, of course, plants are good for us. Mm. Of course, these are going to be the healthy things. And fat, especially animal fat, is bad. Saturated fat from animals is stable doesn't go rancid. <laughs> it doesn't create inflammation. Animal fats are going to be the best thing for you. And they're delicious. <laughs> and, and they are. And they are delicious. <laughs> You've mentioned patients. You have a crossover with lipedema. You know, I interviewed Catherine Sayo a couple of weeks ago, and you work with, with her, with some of her clients. Mm -hmm. And I know some people, uh, well, it's I say people, it's pretty well always women, isn't it? Yes. Have lipedema and lymphedema. Yes. That's a pretty small group, isn't it? It's usually one or the other. Well, uh, interestingly, because obesity is so prevalent, so we're looking at just in the United States, 67% of our population is overweight and obese. So many women who have lipedema also have obesity mm -hmm. and obesity by itself can cause it cause an increased fluid load. And so we can get some swelling around the ankles and uh, the feet just with that. So there is a faction of the lymphatic community that believes that there is no edema associated with lipedema. It is only with obesity that you have that. And when you have obesity co-occurring with uh, lipedema, then you're going to have a lymphatic overload. Um, but uh, some recent research had just come out where they have identified a biomarker that identifies um, lymphatic dysfunction. So actual problems with the lymphatics, um, they're poorly formed, they're misformed, they're not working well. And so this biomarker is high when we have that. So and you would imagine if someone has lymphedema, there is that biomarker is elevated. Well, interestingly, on people with lipedema, Without obesity, that marker is elevated. Mm. With people who have obesity and no lipedema, it's not elevated. They could have still some swelling in their lower limb because of the fluid overload, but they have completely functioning, unimpaired lymphatic vessels. And what we've seen on imaging of women with lipedema is that they actually have, instead of a streamlined lymphatic vessel going straight up their leg, it is a little bit of a corkscrew appearance. And so you can imagine this is not good transport because of that impairment. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing that. And also we are seeing what Dr. Roxon from Stanford University calls the fat and lipedema seems to be waterlogged. There is fluid being retained in the adipocytes and in between the adipocytes in the areas of, of fat. And so um, there is that already there. But now, typically, as Catherine Sayo told you, we don't have the feet aren't affected. You have a huge hips, thighs, buttocks, all the way down to this cuff at the ankle, and then the feet look totally normal. But when we start getting this swelling in the feet and then additional swelling on the legs outside of all of the additional fat, 
then we say that they have what's called lipolymphedema. They now have lipedema and lymphedema. Even though there was a lymphatic problem already, they now have lymphedema as well. The skin changes, the tissues change. Um, it becomes hardened and bumpy and uh, discolored. So we have those happening. And unfortunately, because we have those three conditions happening a lot together, obesity, lymphedema, and lymphedema, we see this actually more than you would think. You start getting, the legs are asymmetrical. Right. So with straight lipedema, you're totally symmetrical. Both legs are the same size, both hips, everything. But when you get lymphedema, always one's bigger than the other. And that's when you start thinking about, no, this woman has both things happening and it's not unfortunately not that unusual mm. but we found out the keto is good for lymphedema obesity and lymphedema so i would hope that any of your listeners that are worried that they might have one or two or even all three of these conditions give it a try it'll help yeah it's you get worried sometimes about being the person who says keto is a cure-all but <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult to find something it doesn't work well for. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and you know what? It's not a, a total panacea. It's mm. not like everything's going to go away. You still have these chronic conditions. You still will have uh, lymphedema from your breast cancer treatment. Mm. You're still going to have, you know, probably a fat disorder. Although people I've seen who have reduced so much with keto you still can see that shape. It's still a little bit larger on the lower half than it is on the upper half of your body. So you still have a chronic condition, but it's way better managed. Your quality of life is, is hugely improved. So no, it is, it's not a cure, mm. but life is, is worth living again. <laughs> you know, it, it's your quality of life is, is much, much better. Absolutely. So here on Kauai, we are overrun by uh, chickens and roosters. And so <laughs> they do tend to crow all day and all night. Oh, right. So they're not actually yours. They're just wild ones. No. I quite like the sound, actually. Some people don't, but I do. We'll put some links and resources in the show notes, but where can people find you and find more information? I work with uh, Catherine Sayo, as you said, at the Lipedema Project. So you can find me at thelipedemaproject.org. And uh, we also have lipedemasimplified.org that you can also find us. I also have my own website. It's my name, leslinkeith.com. I have lots of information there about lymphatic disorders as well as fat disorders and keto so that's a good resource. I have written a book. It's available as a uh, PDF download. So you can go to my website and you can get that book. It's the ketogenic solution for lymphatic disorders. And for clinicians, I have the same program that I used in my research study. I have developed that into a program for other clinicians to use. Oh, fantastic. So it's called Lymphatic Lifestyle Solutions Program. And you can find out about that on my website. Interestingly, I've always done the program live with groups, but because of the pandemic, one of the clinicians who's using my program uh, has made it into an online type thing so he could still work with his patients while they were not able to come in. So it can be adapted to be uh, done with telemedicine if that's uh, what you need to do. Fantastic. That's how you can find me. Um, I would also, you know, I, I give out my email if anybody wants to correspond with me. That's fine with me. It's my name, Leslin Keith, O as in Oscar, T as in Tom. So it's OT for occupational therapy um, at gmail.com. Perfect. Thank you. Well, it's been wonderful speaking to you today. Perhaps you could leave us with a top tip. The main thing I wanted to be able to tell people about my book and, and the program and the resource of my website and we just did that but I would tell people that anybody who's listening who thinks they might have a lymphatic or fat disorder or they just want to make their lymphatics healthier that if you're not already consider cutting the carbs and eating a higher fat eating healthy fat only diet and even consider going over to that animal source food spectrum if you're already doing keto to, to consider doing it that way because as we've been said several times during this time we've been together is 
a healthy lymphatics is a healthy life, is a, a better quality of life. So consider this way of eating. So I think by far anything else that you can try doing to help yourself, diet is going to be the key. Yes, it's really part of our system that's so important, but that is rarely thought about as much. So it's it's something we, we need to look after a lot more, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Fat fuels the lymphatics. Fantastic. I love that. Fat fuels the lymphatics. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking some time out to talk to me today. It's been a really great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Daisy. It's been wonderful. To get the resources and links from this show, please go to ketowomanpodcast.com forward slash episodes. Please share this podcast with as many people as possible by sharing one of my links or just taking a screenshot of an episode that you enjoyed. Reviews really help raise the profile of the podcast, which gets it in front of more people, but also helps me attract a wide variety of guests. So please take a minute to leave a review on whichever podcast app or platform you like to listen on. It doesn't go unnoticed by me, the people who regularly like, share and comment on my posts. Your support really does mean the world to me. Thank you. Are you enjoying this podcast? Help me make more episodes and videos by making a pledge at my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash keto woman or simply hit the support button on the Keto Woman Podcast website. Don't forget to join in the fun on the Keto Woman Podcast Instagram and Facebook pages and Daisy underscore Keto Woman on Twitter. Are you my next extraordinary woman? Maybe you've got an idea for a show, a topic you would like to hear about. Let me know how I can tickle your earbuds by dropping me a line at daisy at ketowomanpodcast.com. This week's end quote is from Jerry Dunn. Don't limit your challenges, challenge your limits. Bye-bye, Keto lovelies.